Welcome to the British Home Front in the First World War. This series was recorded at the University of St Andrews in June 2018 to accompany a conference marking the contribution by the peoples of the British Isles to the national war effort. In this podcast, we hear from Professor Chris Williams about the experience of the war in Wales. My name is Chris Williams. I am currently head of the College of Arts, Celtic Studies and Social Sciences at University College Cork in Ireland. But I am a Welshman and I'm a historian of Wales and I've worked for most of my career in Welsh universities. Part of my work has been focused on the Welsh experience of the First World War. When I was a young boy, probably seven or eight, I was aware that one of my great-grandfathers had fought in the First World War because in my grandmother's house there was a, a wooden model tank that he had carved. He died more than 10 years before I was born, but I had his service medals. In 1995, my wife and I were on holiday and we visited Mehmet's Wood on the Somme. We went to the Welsh Dragon Memorial I was looking out at the wood and along came this other military historian who was a Welshman from Llanelli who was doing some, I think, preliminary research prior to bringing a party of visitors to the area. In conversation, I said, I think my great-grandfather fought on the Western Front. I'm not exactly sure where. I said, I should know, really. And he said, yes, you should. (laughs) And uh, that prompted me then to go back and start digging into his story looking through the medal rolls, looking up the war diary of the unit with which he served. He was 53 when he joined in 1915. So he was well over the upper limit at that time. He was 40 or 41 to join the army. So he must have lied about his age to get in. He joined as a private soldier, the 11th South Wales Borderers, which was known as the Second Gwents, because they were drawn from the Monmouthshire Valleys, which is where he was living. So he went into the Welsh infantry and he served until he was invalided out in February 1918. When I was doing all of this research, my father came to me in a sort of confidential manner. And he said, as you're digging into this, he said, I think I ought to tell you something. And it was that my other great-grandfather on my father's side, who prior to the war was a butcher in Risca, just north of Newport, had actually been to Wormwood Scrubs because he was a conscientious objector. He was a Baptist. And when he was conscripted, he refused to serve. So he'd been to Wormwood Scrubs for a year. My father and my father's family had kept this information quiet. There was a sense of shame around it that he'd been to prison, whereas, of course, for me, it was tremendous to have on the one side of this family this great-grandfather who had gone off when nobody would have expected him to serve to join the Colours, and then this other great-grandfather who, very true to his principles, had actually been prepared to go to prison rather than fight. On the eve of the war in 1914, Wales was quite a successful economic unit within the overall British economy. The coal industry and the iron and steel industries in particular were close to the height of their influence and their productivity levels. Wales was pretty self-confident. It had quite a lot of influence within government circles. The leading light, of course, of Welsh politics of the day was David Lloyd George, at that time Chancellor of the Exchequer, who'd really made his name in the years leading up to the war with the People's Budget of 1909 and the subsequent political deliberations around that. It was also a Wales that was beginning to get to the very end of a long period of discussion over its religious and national identity, which took the form of proposals to disestablish the church of England in Wales. A royal commission had been set up in 1906, There had been lengthy deliberations around that. Eventually, a bill had moved through Parliament, and when war broke out, it was on the point of getting royal assent. It actually got royal assent in September 1914. Had it been implemented, then the disestablishment of the church would have taken place immediately. It was actually postponed until after the end of hostilities, so it wasn't enacted until 1920. But that was closing off really a 45-year, 50-year struggle, which had been seen as vitally important by Welsh nonconformists as some kind of recognition 
of the specific identity and culture of Wales, very much within the context of the British state. This disestablishment wasn't about Wales breaking away from the United Kingdom in any shape or form, although for some people it might have been a prelude to a moderate form of home rule, a kind of devolution within the empire. Wales was troubled in the years leading up to the outbreak of the war by significant industrial unrest, particularly in the transport industries and in the coal industry. And that was to rumble on into the years of the war itself and make Wales one of the storm centres of industrial unrest in 1915, 16, 17, which gave the government significant concern. On the eve of the war, Wales did not have an extensive martial tradition. There was no major pattern of Welshmen joining the army. There were Welsh regiments, the Royal Welsh Fusiliers, the Welsh Regiment, the South Wales Borderers, but the proportion of Welsh men of military age joining the colours was actually much, much lower than you might have expected given the size of the population. The population of Wales was between two and two and a half million at that time. So it's about 5% of the total population of the United Kingdom, but only 1.4% of the men in military service were from Wales. So it was not an area where military recruitment had a very strong attraction. Partly that was because the Welsh economy had been very buoyant. So going off to join the army as a refuge from unemployment hadn't necessarily been an issue for a lot of Welsh men. And partly, I think, the Welsh nonconformist ethos was not exactly pacifist, but it didn't really endorse militarism. There was a reserve and a detachment there. When war breaks out, there are a number of issues which are resolved over the first few weeks, one of which was whether the very strong labour movement would express any reservation about going to war. The South Wales miners didn't want to work additional bank holiday days in the beginning of August 1914, despite the fact the Admiralty needed the coal. So there was some tension there, although that was worked out relatively quickly. The other thing was how the politicians and the churches in Wales would respond to the outbreak of war. David Lloyd George had been a standout opponent of the South African War of 1899 to 1902, and had made his name in British politics at that time. So the possibility that David Lloyd George might have opposed going to war was quite real. He seems to have taken some considerable time to decide what his position was going to be. He comes to an event in London in September 1914 at the Queen's Hall. It's an audience of largely London Welsh people and he makes a very important speech, most of which is about the threat that Germany poses to the European order, to Britain, about the moral principles that are involved in this discussion. But he places Wales' response to Germany's threat at the heart of that narrative, and he frames it by comparing Wales with Belgium as what he calls a five-foot-five nation, a small nation. And this idea that Germany is trampling on the rights of small nations like Belgium and that the Welsh should respond to that by being sympathetic to the Belgians. Then he does something else which is quite significant. He calls for the formation of a Welsh army corps. He attaches the current crisis to a Welsh martial tradition which stretches back in his rhetoric to before the Norman conquest. It taps into ancient Celtic tribes struggling for their rights against Saxon invaders, Norman invaders, the proud struggles of the age of the princes in the 13th century, those of the Glyndwr rebellion in the early 15th century. This idea that the Welsh can, with a clear conscience, and with a strong sense of their national heritage, take their place now alongside the English, the Scots, the Irish, the men of the dominions as well, in fighting this tyrannical threat of Germany. It's a very effective speech. It's very well responded to in the press. It provides a thread then for Lloyd George to return to at various times throughout the war to identify Wales and Welsh national feeling with the war effort formation of a Welsh army corps 
never happens because there aren't enough Welsh men to fill a Welsh army corps, partly because lots of Welshmen had already volunteered, either joining existing Welsh regiments, or in some cases they went into English regiments or into the artillery. But there is a 38th Welsh division. This is a new army, a PALS battalion type formation, which goes out to France in late 1915 and then which is blooded on the Somme in 1916. Welsh troops, of course, regular territorial troops, new army battalions such as those in the 38th and others, see service all across the world. South Wales borderers are in China at the beginning of the First World War. There are Welsh servicemen at Gallipoli. Quite a significant Welsh formation, the 53rd Territorial Force Division, is in the campaign in Mesopotamia and Palestine. There are, of course, significant numbers on the Western Front. The Welsh Guards are formed in 1915. Again, it's part of this official recognition and enshrining of Welsh patriotism as part of the response to the threat of Germany. The 38th Welsh Division is probably the formation that has attracted the greatest attention because this was a distinctively Welsh unit. It was formed of citizen soldiers and many of the senior officers were themselves Welsh. They're blooded at the Battle of Mehmet's Wood in July 1916. This is a traumatic experience. It's a very difficult battle. It's eventually a successful battle in that the wood is taken, but at the price of fairly high casualties. And it's not taken as swiftly and as efficiently as Douglas Haig would have wanted. And the reputation of the division is somewhat smirched as a consequence. There's a sense in which the division is seen as a political division, too heavily influenced by Lloyd George. The divisional commander is replaced during the battle because he's seen as inefficient and effectively a political appointee. He was a former Liberal Member of Parliament. The division performs much better in the Battle of Third Epe in 1917, the battle which is otherwise known as Passchendaele, and continues to function effectively throughout the remainder of the war and sees a lot of action in 1918. The emphasis in Welsh culture since the war has been on the usual tropes, the tragic slaughter of innocent men on the Western Front, the position of the Trous of Vunith, shepherd soldier, Ellis Evans at Hayeth Wynn, who is conscripted into the armed forces, killed at Third Epe in 1917. Prior to going into battle, he had composed a poem for the Nationalist Sethford. When the Nationalist Sethford is held at Birkenhead, he's dead. But he wins the, the chair, one of the two big poetic prizes at the Nationalist Sethford. The chair is draped in black cloth as a symbolic act of mourning. The legacy of Heathwin in Welsh culture and the resonance of that sacrifice, this simple yet poetic man who is slaughtered in Flanders, is an immensely powerful one. For some, he's seen as representing a kind of anti-war stance. If you look at his writing and his poetry, it's a little bit more complicated than that. He was perhaps an unwilling soldier, but he still was prepared to don uniform. He wasn't a conscientious objector. He may have felt compelled to join the colours because that way he could have protected his younger brother, possibly from being called up. And in agricultural areas, very often maintaining some level of family labour on the farm was a critical issue. So when the war breaks out, the response in Wales is not significantly different from the response elsewhere in mainland Britain. There are certain levels of enthusiasm and excitement around the war. There's a significant wave of young men coming forward to volunteer for the colours. Very large numbers of men from within the South Wales coalfield, Ingle Morgan and Monmouthshire, volunteer to join the army, which prompts problems because you then have some labour shortages in the coal mines within a few weeks. So there's no great opposition to the war in Wales at that initial stage. And the nonconformist churches, by and large, muster behind the war effort also. There are occasional dissenting voices, but they're not very prominent in 1914 and 1915. The very fact that Lloyd George has a senior role within the government 
and that Welsh church disestablishment was more or less on the statute book, helps the Welsh nonconformist churches, which were immensely powerful and important organisations in civil society, it helps them to come to terms with the conflict. What begins to change that sense of consent around the war effort are some of the problems with industrial unrest. The coal industry had been a site of a lot of industrial warfare and strike activity, 1910, 1911, 1912. And many of those issues are unresolved when the war breaks out. Miners are in clearly what is a very dangerous occupation. They're relatively well paid, but those wages are constantly having to be negotiated depending on which seams and which mines are opening up. And price inflation begins to affect working class families across Wales, as in other areas of Britain in 1915. So rents are going up, food prices are going up, and there's this pressure then on living standards. So there's a demand for a better wage settlement. And in 1915, that prompts a strike, which is coalfield wide. It lasts for a little over a week. It is in defiance of the government. Strictly speaking, I think it was an act of treason, but the government can't imprison more than a quarter of a million coal miners if they decide they're not going to work. So there's a settlement reached relatively quickly. But the very fact that that could happen in wartime, when coal is a vital strategic industry, indicates how serious the industrial relations problems were. The government takes the coal industry into some measure of state control, particularly in 1916, begins to manage industrial relations in the coal industry. But there is ongoing industrial unrest. It's never quiet in the South Wales coal field. When in 1917 the government brings in a commission of inquiry into industrial unrest, the report on South Wales is a very substantial one. The other issue then, which comes along 1915, 1916, and which is a bit of a crisis of conscience in Welsh society, is conscription. It's one thing to have voluntary enlistment and for nonconformist churches and other Christians to accept that the war with Germany is perhaps just war or necessary war and support the war effort. It's different when it becomes a matter of compulsion. And a number of leaders of churches and political figures and industrial leaders struggle with that the idea that the state has the right to call upon people to serve in the colours. This prompts an internal disintegration in the Welsh liberal establishment in 1916, which isn't really fully evident until after the war. Other issues which come to the fore in Wales on the home front in 1917, 1918, there's certainly war weariness in 1917, a sense that the war is dragging on, there's no end in sight, rents, rates, inflation... Food shortages, these are all major challenges for working families. There's disruption to the industrial economy. Women are being brought into the workforce. That's not a straightforward process. So there's a sense in which it's no longer a united society. It's becoming more fragmented. There's spaces opening up in which different versions of some kind of post-war future are being imagined. Some of them are quite radical. Some of them are Marxist. There's a significant what is to be the Communist Party presence within the South Wales coalfield by 1917. It's seen as a problem area by government, by leaders of industry, actually by trade union leaders who have some concerns over how controllable South Wales is. And then on top of that, you've got a sense from some people, the liberal nationalists really, that Wales has been investing heavily in the war effort and it will deserve some kind of recognition and reward at the war's end. This leads to a return of the demand for some form of home rule, particularly, of course, after December 1916 when David Lloyd George is Prime Minister. It's thought, well, he was in favour of this back in the 1890s. Surely now, when he's Prime Minister, he will enact it as soon as he has a chance. When the war ends, there has to be a general election. The last general election was in December 1910. Normally, there would have been a general election in 1915. It's postponed because of wartime conditions. It's held within a month of the end of the war. Sometimes it's known as the khaki election because of the soldiers who were voting 
Sometimes it's known as the coupon election. The reason for that is that by 1918, Lloyd George was prime minister of a coalition government. Some liberals, but mostly conservative and unionists, he decided to go to the country and ask for this coalition government to be re-elected. His office had to contact potential liberal candidates in the different constituencies and either offer them the opportunity to be part of this government should they be re-elected. If they were dissenting voices, then they weren't going to be on the ticket, as it were. If a candidate was in receipt of this letter, this coupon, then they were on Lloyd George's side. So this becomes known as the coupon election. It was the first election at which some women had the vote. And the terms of the franchise for men had altered also, so that all men of the age of 21 and over now had the vote. Lloyd George is re-elected, the coalition is returned to office, and he's then in power for almost four years. It's seen as an opportunity to build a new kind of Britain. Now, it doesn't happen for all sorts of reasons, some of which are to do with a particularly critical financial situation, some of it's to do with industrial unrest. There are big strikes in the transport industry. There's a huge strike in 1921 in the coal industry. From a Welsh perspective, Lloyd George is seen as not delivering on the hopes around some kind of devolution or home rule settlement for Wales. Nothing happens there. And by people in the industrial districts, he's seen as betraying the interests of the Welsh working class. So it's a period of considerable disillusionment. And although the coal industry undergoes a brief post-war boom as the European economies reset themselves, by the middle of the 1920s, the South Wales coal industry like many other coal industries around Britain, is in severe crisis. There then follows, of course, a significant economic depression with high levels of unemployment in the late 1920s and into the 1930s. So the post-war experience for Wales economically is not a happy one. Politically, Lloyd George is prime minister, but the Liberal Party beneath him is disintegrating and split. After he falls out of office in 1922, the Liberals in Wales, as in much of the rest of Britain, fragment and really disappear. So the dominant political force in Wales by the early 1920s is the Labour Party, which remains the largest political party in Wales for the rest of the 20th century. The nonconformist churches and the churches more generally, I think the First World War does represent a crisis for them. There's not an immediate falling off in church attendance. It takes some time but I think there's a loss of authority. And the position of religious leaders in public discourse is less than it would have been prior to the war. The First World War, in some ways, marks the end of a very expansive period for Wales and the Welsh people. Almost everything that comes after is an anticlimax or is a problem. It's only really in the 1950s and 60s that Wales begins to regain some of that confidence and optimism it had had in the Edwardian period. The First World War in Wales has not been seen as a major area of historical research until fairly recently. There were, of course, the usual memoirs of Welsh soldiers, and some of them very famous soldiers who served with Welsh regiments, people like Robert Graves and Siegfried Sassoon, for example, But historians of Wales have been reluctant to embrace the story of the First World War. I think that's for a couple of reasons. The dominant narratives in Welsh history have either been nationalist with a small n, championing the distinctive identity of Wales, and for some, seeing Wales as moving towards devolution or some measure of political self-government, which happened at the end of the 1990s, In that context, the First World War doesn't represent a glorious story because nothing really happens. The other dominant narrative would be the socialist interpretation of Welsh history, a focus on working class struggle. And although the First World War is an important moment in that regard because you have tremendous amount of industrial unrest, you have real pressure being put on the government to nationalise the coal industry, you have a lot of sympathy for the Russian Revolution, you have a high point in terms of Marxism in the South Wales coalfield. None of it yields anything, ultimately. So the First World War is a problem because from the nationalist point of view, you've got a lot of evidence of Welsh people being very patriotic about Britain, 
which isn't very comfortable. And from a socialist point of view, you've got a lot of Welsh men coming forward and joining the army enthusiastically. And that, again, is a bit problematic. So I think there's been a failure to want to own the First World War. What that's left has been the usual kind of space in which the story of the First World War as a terrible, futile slaughter has dominated. And then you have the elements like Heath Wynne being woven into that narrative as a particularly Welsh twist, the slaughter of the innocents. Interestingly, in Wales, even though the vast majority of people had been prepared to support the war and see the war through to its conclusion, quite quickly there opens up a space in Welsh society for those who express dissenting voices to be seen as legitimate also the first conscientious objector to be elected Member of Parliament in Wales is Morgan Jones in Caerphilly in 1922. Now, that's very quick after the end of the war. Some of the people who would have voted for him, presumably, would have been ex-servicemen who would have seen their comrades killed, and yet they're voting in a conscientious objector. And so perhaps the way in which the war was being understood, even within just a few years, was changing very rapidly. Professor Chris Williams on the experience of the war in Wales. You have been listening to the British Home Front in the First World War. The podcast series was made possible thanks to the generosity of John Cawthorn and the 1926 Foundation. The conference was supported by the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport and the Scottish Government. It was a Chrome Radio production for the University of St Andrews, with music by the pipes and drums of the Royal Scots Dragoon Guards. The producer was Katrina Oliphant, with sound design by Chris Sharp. The series editor was Professor Sir Hugh Strawn. In our next podcast, we hear from La Joy and Professor Fergal McGarry about the experience of the war in Ireland.